In this week of the module, we start exploring many different behaviors of our mind and their relation to sustainability. Some important concepts that we will explore this week are thinking and cognition, the idea of psychological flexibility, mindfulness and values. Some core conceptual questions that we'll start to try to answer are how does our mind influence our well-being and our ability to cooperate? What exactly are human values and what is the role of values in our well-being and in sustainability? What is mindfulness and what is its role in our well-being and in sustainability? And how does the idea of psychological flexibility influence our well-being and our ability to cooperate? There are, there are links to different skills and competencies that we want to develop in students and in ourselves through these themes. So it's the skill, the ability to first of all notice and sort our different inner experiences into certain kinds of concepts. We can also use the themes of this in the following week to develop cooperation competency, evaluation competency and self-regulation competency. So we will see that exploring behaviors of our mind can really be helpful in contributing to the development of these core competencies. Let's just recap what we have already uh, learned in this module so far. So first of all, we had been exploring what exactly is actually behavior through a variety of methods. And we decided that actually things that happen inside of us, like in our mind, thinking, feeling, certain sensations that we notice, many psychologists and behavioral scientists also consider these behaviors, even if they just happen inside of us. These are often called covert behaviors because they are covered or secret and not visible to others compared to the more overt behaviors that are public and visible that we do with our body. And these inner covert behaviors and the outer overt behaviors of organisms, they influence each other. We also mentioned that it can be helpful to consider our inner behaviors, our thoughts, memories, sensations, feelings, also as type of behaviors, because they share important features with our outer behaviors. They develop through learning throughout our lifetime, that means just as we learn to walk, to do certain things with our hands and so on, we also learn to think, to notice, to feel just, uh, just as much. And our inner behaviors, our thoughts, feelings are also more or less automatic and, and conscious, consciously controllable, just like our outer behaviors. And this might be something important for us to understand. And um, another aspect is that even though our inner behaviors are not visible to others, they often are, we can say, visible or noticeable to us. We as individuals have the ability to notice what is happening inside of us, what we are thinking, what we are feeling, uh, what it feels like in our body. And even though others' inner behaviors are not visible to us, we in fact certainly are spending a lot of time thinking and wondering about what is going on in other people's minds. This is something that um, sometimes is called theory of mind, our ability to imagine, to predict, to assume, assume what is going on in other people's minds. And this fact also very much influences how we might react to other people. And especially human inner behavior is so complex and dynamic and there's so much going on inside of us and it's also so much part of our everyday experience that it is important and can be helpful to explore and understand our inner behaviors through the concepts of behavioral science. And so these are just some points why it might be helpful to consider our inner processes of thinking and feeling also as behaviors because we can use the tools, the methods, the concepts of behavioral science to understand them better. Another thing to remember is that 
scientists are not so sure really where the boundary of behavior is with res respect to all the other things that are happening in our body, like um, sweating, heartbeat, or digestion in itself. They might not be considered behaviors. These are more just physiological processes in our body, but our responses to those would be considered behaviors, uh, including our outer and inner responses. So whether we start to do something with our body in response to these things, whether we actually notice these things, so noticing in itself can be considered a behavior, us becoming aware of something that is going on in our body can be a behavior, and even how we start to feel or think about these things, that makes it then actually a behavior. And so, yes, instead of hard boundaries between what our body does, how, how we behave, and what our brain does, and how we think, it can be better to just think about these a little bit more fluidly and highly integrated, such as emotional responses in our body. They might be um, not considered a behavior, but as soon as we notice what is going on, we are actually uh, entering maybe the concept of behavior. Another thing to repeat is that we explored um, the framework of Tinbergen's questions. This can be a helpful framework to help us remember when we explore the different causes of behavior, including our inner behaviors. So Nicholas Tinbergen, he was an ethologist, and he uh, proposed that we can ask four bigger categories of questions um, when we want to explore and sort different types of causes of behavior of organisms. So we can look at, first of all, the immediate triggers and proximate physiological mechanisms that cause a behavior. We can look at development of an individual, the learning history, how did the behavior develop over an individual's lifetime. We can look for causes in the uh, ancestral history, meaning the cultural as well as evolutionary history of the generations before the organism. So where does the behavior come from really when we're looking into the distant past. And we can ask about the functions or the adaptive value of a behavior and um, meaning does the behavior cause the individual to repeat it uh, in the future or not? Or does the behavior lead to it becoming more or less common in a population, for example, through natural selection? If you want to kind of repeat a little bit your understanding about Timberg's questions, you can go back to the resources, including in the teacher guide, uh, read up on it a little bit. Because we will come back to using this framework over and over again when we're looking at specific kinds of behaviors of our mind. One thing already to mention is that when we're looking at evolutionary history, we can say and we will see that evolution really has shaped our mind. One nice introduction to this kind of conceptualization is this video from the psychologist Russ Harris, The Evolution of the Human Mind, which tells us a little bit about what really our mind evolved uh, to do, what was the function, and how do, might this cause us problems in today's world, and to help us already think about what might be some possibilities for dealing with our evolved human mind. What can we do as individuals, as society, and what might be the role of education? Another idea that uh, we will come back to when we're exploring our mind, our mind is really that cooperation has strongly shaped our mind. Due to our evolutionary history as a cooperative species, our mind has many behaviors that serve to, in fact, foster cooperation within groups as well as competition with other groups. And this is also one aspect that will become important when we're thinking about what might be some challenges or how might our mind influence our ability to cooperate towards common goals, even on a global level today. And similarly, our thinking is strongly influenced by the social and cultural environments that we grow up in. So there's a huge cultural diversity in how humans think, even perceive the world. So with these kind of uh, introductory words, let's, you, I invite you to already kind of think about, you know, this big conceptual question, how, do, how does our mind influence our well-being and our ability to cooperate towards a sustainable future? 
think about this question already and maybe collect some ideas about how you would already answer this question based on what you just know about our mind from your previous learning and from your everyday experience. This is really a question that we will continue to explore in the next two weeks. Thank you.